I think uh, this is an eye opener about uh, you know the blind football because you know nobody has ever spoken about it. And I think you are going to give a lot of inputs and insights so that you know people can go and spread. And uh, you being the vice president of uh, Blind Football Association, this is going to help the people too, because always the uh, news uh, carries around from people to people, and that's how the uh, game grows, right? Yes, it does. Yeah, it's all about. I mean, the, that's all of uh, that's what we are exactly trying to do with blind football in Tamil Nadu. It's uh, uh, it's okay. almost what, what I would call an evangelization to spread the message uh, that blind okay. people can also play football. It's a message uh, and it's a culture that has to be spread uh, because over the years, uh, blind people have never played any kind of contact sport, uh, so they've been restricted mostly to non-contact sports and. Uh, so there's been a bit of cricket. Uh, there's a bit of uh, volleyball has been there. Kabaddi was tried for for a while, and I think uh, it has uh, been put on the back burner for the moment. Uh, but football now at the moment is beginning to gain popularity, and it has been slowly spreading in the last three or four years in India. So yes, uh, we need to spread this message, and we do have a very large percentage of our population that has got visual challenges, uh, or we categorize them as blind itself. So yes, uh, we 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 do have a lot of work ahead of us to make this game popular for the blind population. Actually, yes, you know, because I have uh, heard from my coaches also, and I, uh, I, in fact, you know, it is not to degrade somebody or something, but obviously, when we are coaching a normal student, when they miss a goal or when they miss some uh, passes or when they are not able, to, we always say, "Are you blind? You can't you uh, look at the ball? Can't you look at the partner?" So this is the word that we use it, okay? And now we are here to talk about blind football, like you know, it is mesmerizing. And uh, so we are here to hear more about you. So how did you get the interest of you know uh, getting into the coaching of uh, blind uh, people, like because it is a, it is it needs a lot of attention and it needs a lot of patience, right? And I know people have been telling you like your a few of your students are here and they have been saying that you know you are very strict. As well as your jovial, that's why uh, many of them, uh, you know, keep uh, coming to learn football from you. So, can you share, like, you know, how you got into this uh, coaching of uh, blind football? So, as I said, like, uh, one of the things uh, that I've been very passionate about is working with people with determination. Uh, so, whatever kind of determination, or uh, the normal word is you say disabled, but I hate to use that word disabled. Uh, I find them more as people who are determined to do things in life. And uh, when I say it, uh, and uh, so my experiences have been mostly with special athletes, working with Special Olympics as a resource person since 2007 in India. Before that, I used to work uh, in as, as a personal training capacity with some of the children uh, in Dubai, uh, especially from uh, the royal family in Dubai. I used to work with them. And uh, then later on, uh, when I came to India in 2007, I got involved with Special Olympics Tamil Nadu and Special Olympics Bharat, and I've been working with them as a resource person. Uh, but in 2017, uh, I've, uh, I've been doing this program for Standard Chartered Bank and Liverpool Football Club. We uh, host one of the largest corporate tournaments uh, in India every year. And as a part of the outreach of the CSR part, uh, one year they wanted to do a session for the blind students. So uh, I was asked, can you do a session for the blind students? Like, I said, I've never done blind football. I don't even know what it is like either. They said, no, the Liverpool Football Club has insisted that they want to work with the blind. And so I had to sit down and start preparing. And uh, the first thing I realized was uh, uh, from my research is to get the ball. So when I spoke to the company and asked them, can, uh, do you have the actual blind balls? They said, yeah, that's not a problem. We will get the balls. And uh, so then I started doing my research and uh, at that time it was going to be Steve McManaman. He was going to be the celebrity player who was coming for this, uh, this event. Like. And this was going to be held in the Victoria School for the Blind, which is one of the oldest schools in Mumbai for blind. This is the first blind school in India, literally, at the Victoria okay. School for the Blind. And uh, so when I got down there on the day of the event and I met the kids, I met the school and then they were all so excited and uh, they never played football in their life. And I was like, you know, why? Like, you know, uh, why? I mean, when I did all my research, there's already a World Cup happening. The game is a part of the Paralympics. And how come these kids, these kids in a blind school, uh, we have not even experienced this game yet. 
They said, we play cricket, we are playing this, we are playing that, but we never played football. This is the first time we were football. Like. And uh, so we had a, then uh, we had a great experience, uh, sort of like uh, I did some drills with them, uh, which I sort of had created my own, adapted my own drills. But later on when I did my research, I realized that they were the foundation drills for dribbling and passing in blind football as a part of the coaches program. So I was pretty much thinking on the same lines as what is already existing in the coaches manual. Like. And Steve was like, when I met Steve, he said, Sebastian, I haven't got any idea about blind football. I was told that you are the expert, so you lead and I will follow you. Like, okay. and So we had a great session. And uh, But the thing was that many of the kids in this group were mixed because in blind, they have the different categories of blind. When you say B1, B2, B3. So that's various degrees of blindness. Like, So they were mixed. And uh, the kids were able to do the skills. And uh, we had a small match at the end of it. And they were all excited about it. So when I came back, I was like, you know, why is this not happening anywhere else in the in the part of the country? I thought. But then when I did my research, I realized that the IBF is already existing. Uh, the Indian Blind Football Federation was functioning from Kochi. Uh, there was an Indian okay. team, uh, which was also a part of the uh, the national setup, and they've been participating in tournaments. So then I called up the president, his name is Sunil Matthews, and then I spoke to him and he said, Sebastian, why don't you come over? We are having a regional tournament. Uh, we have some teams coming from Northeast and uh, Kerala and things like Karnataka. And there was no team from Tamil Nadu. So I went over there and uh, then I, sp I spent some time, about 10 days with them. And I, in fact, they gave me a couple of players from each team and I had my own team, which I was, co I was coaching and working with them and we played in the tournament. So that was my first involvement. Then I went back later and did the coaches course when we had uh, Yuli, who is the president of the World Blind Federation. He came down to Kochi and he did the coaches course. So I did the coaches course and then uh, later on, uh, the boys in Loyola College got in touch with me. And they said, we heard that you are the certified coach here. We want to form a team. Like I said, I've been looking for players. I didn't know where to look. Okay. And you guys have come to me like, you know, so... Uh, there was this uh, bunch of kids who was led by a guy called Bharati Raja, who is our secretary now uh, of the Blind Football Federation, and uh, Raj Kumar, who is our president. Uh, so those guys came up, they met me, we had a chat, and then I had started arranging some sessions for them in uh, Loyola College. I got some balls, we had the first sessions, and then uh, we went off to play two tournaments to the, in Bangalore and one in Kochi. Uh, which was uh, fairly good because uh, we uh, because we were a beginning team, so they gave us some players uh, from the other teams. So it has been a good start. Uh, but now we are looking at how we can start taking this even further, making the whole organization into a real professional setup, having a mission, vision, and a statement of where we want to be in about four or five years. So how is the uh, Indian standard comparing to the world because you said there is a world uh, cup and all that so we are uh, can yeah. you just uh, elaborate on the tournaments that is being held? So when you talk about the world standards of course there's uh, our friends from Brazil are like right on top there uh, then you have Argentina then you have Spain so and now England is coming along very strongly so they are very well their, their standard is like really really high. So for India, I think the goal would be to try and get into the Asian level. So at the moment, India is sort of ranked 5, 6, uh, with China being on top. But then you have Japan, and then you have Korea, and you have Thailand, Malaysia, Iran. Uh, so like these are the, the top ones. So we are in the top 6, you can say, at the moment. Uh, okay. But it's a long, but there is a big, like, the, like China is... Uh, they were I made mean, with the Beijing Olympics in the, Para, the, the Paralympic Games in Beijing. They were the runners up to Brazil. And uh, they were a country that didn't even have a team of blind footballers before they uh, bid for the games. And once they got the bid, they were like, yes, we are going to make sure that we achieve the highest level possible. So it was basically finding 10, 20 blind guys and putting them through the whole thing for eight years and getting them trained to the very, very highest level. Like. So there's a lot of government support. So Chinese standard is as good as the world standard. Uh, the rest, Iran is also getting on there. Uh, but we have got a long way to go, realistically. But uh, until and unless we uh, really develop the the next line of players, so the because our current lot of players who are playing for the Indian team are already 22, 23, 
and uh, the motivation has to be there for them to stay on the play for the uh, the national team uh, yeah. but uh, uh, you know how are we going to motivate them i mean how are we going to make sure that they still spend time for football instead of trying to make a living uh, so there the challenges are there now you know we don't have any contracts they don't have jobs or anything so there's a lot of challenges ahead but yes we see how everything will be met one step at a time i suppose so talking about the challenges what about the infrastructure so you know i think you know uh, we playing a normal football we have challenges the main challenge is the infrastructure we don't have a proper ground and you know there are a lot of tournaments where the ground is not proper but still the tournament is on so what type of infrastructure is needed for uh, uh, for a blind uh, for football to be conducted and uh, the equipment yeah. yeah so i'll just give you a brief idea about uh, how the whole game is played uh, so when we play blind football the size of the field is 20 meters by 40 so that is the actual playing style size of the field so in blind football what happens is uh, the field uh, as in regular football you have a goal line and you also have a touch line but the touch line is got side boards on it it has a 1.1 meter high board that prevents the ball from going outside over the touch line so in blind football there's no such thing as a kick in or a throw in you have what is there is a goal kick and there is a corner kick but there is no kick in or throw in the, uh, because the ball never goes out if it does go out accidentally over the fence it can happen sometimes then it's a drop ball the ref drops the ball and the game starts from there like so that's the basic playing uh, surface for tournaments and the field marking is now the field is divided into three parts uh, so in in blind uh, so in blind football uh, i'm just going to go from one part to one part so the field mark and field is divided into three parts so you can imagine so you have what is called a defending third a middle third and an attacking third so these three zones of the field have got a respect they got a very very important role to play the technical side of the game i will come to it slowly and uh, during a game it comprises of four uh, blind players who are basically b1 category b1 means it's fully blind 94% and above but to also make sure that uh, it's an even field and that there is no peeping blah 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 whatever like uh, before the game uh, blind uh, footballers have to tape their eyes so you put cotton pads on to them and then you tape it and over that you wear a mask you wear like an eye op you wear like. and okay. some players have a prote- and some players have a protective headband because uh, sometimes uh, there can be a, a possibility of collision head on they sort of tend okay. to bang so some of them do have this headband with a cushion on it like, uh, which will sort of soften that impact when they bang heads but at the highest level most players don't use it it's like our players who are, when you talk about shin guards uh you know the younger players will come with these big shin guards and the professional yeah. players have got a small piece of sponge which is only this size like yeah, yeah. so uh, so the same thing happens here the, the higher level players who are very good at the game uh, they don't want the uh, the protection on their head yeah, like sure. uh, so uh, so that's the so four blind players on the pitch and the goalkeeper is a fully sighted individual it could also be a, if you want you can use a b2 or a b3 category which is the lower the different levels of vision for them they can also be used but most teams at the highest level uh, uh, they always uh, look at futsal goalkeepers because that's the kind of reflexes they want because it is uh, most of the goals in blind football are scored outside the the, the d and it's just about 3 meters to 4 meters away from the goal so you don't have time you need to have really really fast reflexes uh, as a goalkeeper which is uh, what you find in the futsal goalkeepers so that's what they look at and uh, the game is 20 20 minutes each half uh, so and there's a bit of futsal rules also that are involved like in accumulation of fouls one of the most important fouls in uh, blind football is so if you are a player who's attacking and you have the ball uh, you have to move the ball you cannot let the ball stand still complete the ball has to be moving so that the other players can hear the ball that is one if you're a defensive player when you are moving towards the ball by listening to the auditory signals from the ball you have to use the word why 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 and if you do not say this word why it's a personal foul on you like in basketball so if you accumulate five personal fouls you're out of the game oh so you cannot be replaced 
and also the uh, the team fouls are also there as in futsal when you accumulate the team fouls the penalty spot starts changing and the wall also is taken away so that we go deeper into the game like this is what happens like and uh, so when it comes to how do you play how the players orient themselves on the pitch uh, most of the uh, highest level players are orienting themselves on the pitch by because they have the side boards so that is the main thing for them they know if they move in this direction there is a board they move this direction there is a board second thing the guides we have what is called the goal guide the goalkeeper and the head coach these are the three people who are always giving them audio commands and guiding them as to when they have to play but only one of these people these three can speak at one time so for example if the ball is in the defending third of the field the goalkeeper he becomes the team guide so he will guide his team in the defensive positions and none of the other two are allowed to speak so in the middle third the head coach who is outside he is the person who will be speaking when the ball goes to the attacking part of the goal behind the goal that you are trying to score against you have a goal guide who will try and guide you to score so when the ball is in the defending third the goal guide and the head coach have to stay quiet they are not allowed to speak if they speak it's a foul against them and it's a team foul so you can also get a card so and once the ball transits from defensive part of the field to the middle part then the head coach takes over so he will be guiding the team the same way as it transits into the attacking part the goal guide will take over so they play a very important role in guiding the players and orienting them where they are on the pitch also. okay that's nice and what about the ball because i think the same question even gabriel has asked is like you know what about the ball the circumference of the ball and you know the weight of the ball the ball is the same size as a futsal is it's a size 4 and it's got the bells inside the ball uh, one of the biggest challenges for us is the cost of the ball the ball is quite expensive compared to the regular football so we are talking of something uh, roughly between 2000 to 2500 for a decent ball which is as good as uh, i mean uh, the best balls in regular football you know today you can buy a good football for uh, in the catalan for about 600 you can get but to uh, to get a basic ball in blind football it cost you 2000 plus right. which is like uh, the the best uh, i mean what we saw a uh, class 1 fifa pro balls like at that price range so yeah uh, the balls are that's the kind of the balls they used in the game and it's very important that the auditory signal from the ball is always there Uh, also uh, let me just remind people that uh, when the game is played it's very uh, in blind football what happens is it is not like other sports where the spectators can cheer uh, the spectators are expected to remain silent you're not allowed you're not supposed to cheer during the game so that the players are able to hear the sound of the ball uh, when there is a stoppage in the game then you can cheer but when the game is on players are expected to keep quiet I mean sorry the spectators are expected to keep quiet. <laughs> And uh, you know what about the surface is it played on a wooden surface or on a turf or uh... whatever is available I mean uh, you know so uh, most of the tournaments that have been played in India have been played on turf on grass natural grass uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, at the at the, uh, at the world games and uh, the olympics they are played on proper tennis court surfaces like a futsal field or anything like so it's a mostly indoor surface. Yeah. And what about the referee like you know who controls how many referees are there in the field and how right. can one become as a referee? Uh so that is also another one of our goals for us as a, in the TFBFA is the is the growth and development of our referees. And so I would like to invite people uh we had actually sent out an invitation uh, earlier asking those who would like to join us as coaches and referees. Uh the the referees play a very important role in uh, the growth of the game. and uh, there is also a basic referees examination that is being conducted to start them and uh, we plan to be hosting a, a course for the referees and the coaches uh, very soon to introduce them to blind football and then we'll do a separate one later on for coaches and then a, a separate one for referees so where we will find get in uh, some of the referees because uh, uh, we have one referee from india who's on the international panel now and i think there are two girls also who are already there on the panel uh, so yeah so the thing is to try and make sure that we have uh, more referees from tamil nadu onto the national panel and then hopefully they can go on to international assignments also 
So to become as a referee, like what one as the qualification needed? Uh, the qualification is basically an, it's, a, it's just a love for this game and a passion to work with uh, blind people and uh, to look at blind people not as a disabled person uh, but to make sure that your role as a referee is to referee the game fairly and not to worry that you are trying to uh, so these are blind people we have to be very so no 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 they, it is it is just that they are blind but everything else is just like how you referee a game anywhere else uh, they don't want any kind of mercy from you so they just want you to be fair strong and square when you're on the pitch Actually, you know, when you are doing, when you are as a coach and as a referee and as a player, you know, uh, as a player, you turn into as a coach. Uh, I mean, or do the refereeing. So when you start playing the game, no, all the referee rules come into your mind. And same way, even the coach being a coach, also the player and a coach again, the coaching thing comes in your mind. So how are you able to balance? Because you are uh, you are a D licensed coach and you have been coaching teams also. So how do you balance this uh, communication? I think as you get hold it becomes easier. <laughs> <And then, laughs> well, when you, when you're young, it's a little difficult to juggle all these balls, right? Uh, but over these years, I've been juggling so many balls in different capacities, and uh, you know, it, it has slowly become a part of my routine. I uh, that's for people ask you. One moment you are with uh, the kindergarten kids, and the next moment you are with the high school. Then the next thing you are doing something with the special kids, and then you're gone off to the blind. So it's yeah. like you know, um, it's about how you're able to. The first thing, of course, is to have a, a genuine passion for sports. And uh, for me, uh, my whole life has been based around everything related to sports, anything with sports, any kind of sports. Uh, if I find, uh, if I'm just riding my bike and I see kids just kicking a ball and uh, playing hockey or playing some kind of sport. I will if I have, if I'm not in a hurry I will stamp stop and I will just spend a few minutes just watching it. So anybody doing anything with sports is for me is a big thing. Like so yes, uh, you know, as long as you are able to have that passion, you can always juggle with these things. So uh, so your first uh, assignment as a coach was with the American school, is it, uh, or uh, where you earlier working no. with the? Uh, no, no, no. My my first assignment with, with coaching was uh, overseas in Dubai. Uh, so as soon as I, uh, I was working in a school down there, so that but my school team was the first thing. Uh, but then later on, uh, after, apart from school, we had what is called the expat league in, in Dubai, which was a pretty high standard of mostly. Uh, when I went in in '87, uh, there were hardly any Indians playing in that. It was mostly Europeans playing it. Uh, it was a European league, and um, I sort of broke that ceiling and went in and joined them. And uh, it was a very highly competitive league, very high standard. I mean, after playing uh, uh, to play that kind of uh, physical football, uh, when we are, when we talk about Indian football in those days, uh, it's sort of like touch me not football. As soon as you touch somebody, they get angry. Like, and here you're talking about uh, you know every tackle you feel 85 kilos on your ankle. Uh, and uh, you know, so it was a big experience playing with those guys, being accepted by them because they always thought Indians cannot play cricket or football. The only thing we know to play is cricket. And uh, you know, so sometimes uh, where, when there are words said on the pitch, I say, "Hey, why don't you just go and play cricket?" Like I said, "Why should I go play cricket? I want to play football." Uh, so yeah, it was there that started off, uh, and then we had our community teams. Uh, the Indian community teams, I was coaching them, so we used to have a regular uh, a match between uh, the Kerala state team and the Govan crowd because it's a bigger crowd there. And the Govans used to have this inter-village tournament. Uh, so there I was involved with one or two teams coaching them, refereeing and of course the Kerala team, I was refereeing, uh, coaching that team also, coach and player for them. Uh, and then later on with the American College of Dubai, uh, that's where I got it more into adult football like uh, at, the, at the college level. Like we had a very good team out there for three years, uh, pretty successful in the inter-college championships in, uh, in Dubai. Before I came back to India in <coughs> 2007 and uh, then I started with the American school. We started the, as you are pretty much aware, uh, the first grassroots uh, proper football program in Chennai. 
uh, in 2007 at the American School. But unfortunately, it was only it was a closed program which was only available for the children of the American School. Uh, but I used to find my own way of bringing all our local kids into tournaments and matches, uh, and I used to have a good support from the management. So we had a regular tournaments, the little league matches where most of our academies that used to have like we had Mahogany, ADP, uh, Gateway School, uh, Sishia, and uh, Abacus. There are a couple of schools that we were doing a lot sort of local league down there. And it was a pretty successful program. We had it for about 10 years. Uh, and uh, Mike, uh, uh, you could see the gap in the physical uh, ability of the students uh, of the American school, especially with the boys, the middle school boys from 6, 7, and we had grade 6, 7, and 8. Uh, were able to beat teams from other schools which were class 11 and 12. Uh, and it was the physical difference. The physical difference was making it the thing in life. And the same thing with the girls also. I remember that game when you were coaching the uh, the police team, uh, you send your girls across. And uh, you know, when I told my girls, I was uh, coaching them, uh, the school girls team, and I told them the police girls are coming and they were like, oh my God, like, you know. And you just turned up with five girls or they was there. And they said like, oh, they only have five. Okay, I said, yeah, they only have five. So, they said, but how can they play? They said, no, no, it's okay. You you play full 11. They are going to play with five. And of course, when the match got over, the score was one-sided. Your girls scored about eight or nine or whatever it was. Uh, but it was a learning curve for my girls. And they were like, you know, I said, I brought these girls to, today to school because I wanted you to see what is the highest level of football is available in Tamil Nadu. If you can see that the girls can play at this level, when you go for your tournament to Dhaka, I want you to think that, yes, we have already played against the police girls, so what's the Bombay school girls or the Delhi school girls going to do for us? Like? And it actually did help. It, I mean, mentally, they were like became so strong after playing against your girls. It was like, I mean, there was just three or two or three levels higher than what they were playing. But that was a big learning curve for them. Like, So we had this great program in the American school. Uh, yeah, I went on till about 2017, uh, coaching various teams there. Uh, the, the middle school, high school boys and the high school girls. And then I left in 2017 and now with Monfort. Uh, yeah. And also uh, with some work with Arindam and he started the... Uh, the first I League under 15 team, so for the the first I League in Bangalore when they were hosting it as a single venue tournament, the first season, uh, I was there with his team uh, in Bangalore. Yes, uh, you know those days, like you know, there was so much of uh, you know passion over there, you know, and people used to. This, I'm sure, like you know, after this COVID, when uh, we are missing, you know, watching live, I think definitely once it opens up, I'm sure like people will come forward to. Uh, to the stadium and again the stadium will get filled up so you know this is uh, we just have to keep our uh, fingers crossed because everybody is missing uh, you know watching because whenever I meet my friends also they say it is nothing like going to the stadium and watching the match but when the actually match is there they prefer to sit in the uh, at home in front of the TV and then watch <laughs> yeah yeah I mean there's nothing like watching games yeah, you live you know uh... So those of you, those yeah. of you, uh, us who have had the, who have blessed that generation of going to the stadium and watching live games and enjoying the whole atmosphere of being in live matches there, uh, that was uh, uh, totally a different experience for us. Uh, but those of those, those who have been enjoying the new stadium, it is a completely different experience. You actually don't see that stadium ever being filled. I don't think they've ever got that stadium filled even once for any event. Maybe probably opening games of the SAF. Uh, the opening ceremony, they might have got that stadium filled. Otherwise, it has never been filled up. Hundred percent, because I'm sure, like you know, there are many coaches over here with us, and uh, we have specialized uh, coaches also. They were with us, like uh, Chitra Gangadharan from uh, Bangalore, who is a national coach, and uh, you know, the first woman, uh, Indian woman uh, to play for the World Cup. So she was also with us, and. Uh, even Zakir Hussain was also with us and few other coaches are also there and a few of the international players like Amulya is also here with us listening to us. These are the young coaches. What Amulya was an international player and uh, she's still continuing to play the IWL after giving a 
after having a child and uh, you know that is the inspiration that she has i'm sure like you know listening to you so these type of coaches will definitely come forward and you know learn and you know spread the word like you know like uh, to create and uh, you know they, their thoughts they can put in their thoughts after listening to you i'm sure that uh, this is going to be uh, uh, you know uh, somewhere down the line we have just created a platform for it Yes, uh, that's my wish and hope. Uh, those of uh, people who have joined in, have got this message and uh, understood an opportunity to understand a little more about blind football. And uh, if there's anybody who would like to come out and contribute in any way to the promotion of the game, please do get in touch uh, with us uh, at tnbfa.org. Uh, that's our website. We have created a website. Uh, it just started. It's up and running slowly. Uh, but we do need a lot of help in terms of volunteers uh, coming in and helping us grow this game. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gabriel. It it is uh, really uh, nice for you have to mention it, and I'm really very happy on uh, knowing you through Mr. Sebastian. So definitely, I'm here around in Chennai. So one of the days, I will definitely drop into the place that you are playing to say a hi to you. We'll do that. We will send you an invitation to come and join us.